your favorite channel on YouTube? How many iconic corpses do they give you per video? One iconic corpse? Probably not this channel. We give you one, two, three, even four iconic corpses. No one is giving that kind of iconic corpse coverage right now. We're changing the game on YouTube. The other channels are quaking and that's a promise. Now, some of the female iconic corpses that we've covered have lived the good life and good death. Take Lady Di, the Chinese diva mummy, who lived fat and opulent and rich and went on to live her best mummified death. But other women were not so lucky. Let's be honest, some of the most famous corpses are famous because of how badly their bodies were abused after death. Whether stolen like Eva Peron, exploited like Julia Pastrana or Sarki Bartman, defiled like Maria Milagro de Hoyos, some of these stories can get a little, what's the word, depressing. And sometimes depressing is necessary. Hard stories need to be told, but our series can't turn into a pageant of suffering of women's, especially women of colors, bodies. So today we're looking at women who, with their loyal sisters by their sides, took their lives and corpses into their own hands. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. That's actually an often misquoted line that's... Our first woman, an unlikely Japanese samurai. Takeko Nakano was born in 1847 in what is now Tokyo, during the twilight of the Tokugawa shogunate. We don't have to get too deep in the weeds here, but the shogunate was the feudal military government that ruled Japan, with samurai backing them. During this era, all women of a certain class were supposed to be trained in combat, though most were taught more as an exercise rather than a practical skill. However, Takeko was adopted and instructed by a master of martial arts. Later, she entered training in the region of Aizu to further refine her combat skills, specializing in the naginata, a truly terrifying weapon. Takeko had so much combat prowess that she went on to train other Aizu women warriors for battle. When civil war erupted in 1868 between the spoiler doomed Tokugawa shogunate and the imperial Meiji government, Takeko, along with her mother, little sister Yuko, and 20 or so other women formed what was later known as the Joshitai, or women's army, with Takeko as the primary leader. Did I mention Takeko was 22 at the time? What were you doing when you were 22? I was illegally streaming America's Next Top Model from a Korean website and eating packaged ramen in my room, so. The Tokugawa shogunate officially fell and the Meiji armies invaded Aizu, but the shogunate forces were still fighting valiantly, holding out hope the shogunate could be restored. Takeko and the Joshitai charged outside the safety of the castle gates, even as the gates closed behind them, locking them out. Takeko led her squad to meet up with the commander of the cannon brigade, asking to join forces with them. The commander refused, saying it would make their forces look weak if women were seen fighting among them. Takeko threatened suicide if the Joshitai were not allowed to fight, which is Maybe not the tactic I would have used, but she had probably had it by that point. Not only did the commander refuse to let them fight, he told them to wait for another guy to come round the little ladies up and take them back to the castle. Allegedly, Takeko was like, oh, okay, but then kept going through several other commanders until she finally convinced one to make the Joshitai women's army their own squadron, led by Takeko. The Joshitai were now part of the shogunate forces that would attack the imperial forces at Yanagi Bridge. The night before the attack, Takeko and her mother stayed up late having a debate. You see, Takeko's sister Yuko, one of the Joshitai female warriors, was only 16 years old. They could put Yuko in hiding, but her fate in battle would likely be better than if she was found in hiding. Yuko would come with them for the attack. At the battle at Yanagi Bridge, the Imperial forces tried to take the women warriors alive, but were caught by surprise when the Joshitai fought ferociously, killing many of them. Takeko famously engaged the enemy troops, killing five or six. And let's not forget the Joshitai were vastly outgunned. Literally, they had swords, the enemy had guns. 
In the midst of Takeko's furious battle, she was shot in the chest. As she lay dying, she told her sister Yuko that no matter what, she was not to let Takeko's head be taken as a trophy by the enemy. Yuko, her 16-year-old sister, had to cut it off and take it with her. That escalated quickly. Yuko tried to fulfill her sister's wishes, but she was so physically exhausted from the battle that she was unable to completely sever Takeko's head from her body. Another soldier had to help her complete the task. Yuko wrapped Takeko's head in cloth and took it from the battle, eventually delivering it to a nearby temple, Hokaiji, where it was buried under a pine tree. Takeko's grave, her head, and her naginata remain at the temple to this day. Although the shogunate was never restored, of the almost 5,000 fighters, 660 were women. Takeko's kill count was said to be 172. How far would you be willing to go for your sister's corpse? Would you be willing to become a corpse yourself? From 1930 to 1961, the Dominican Republic suffered under the dictatorship of Rafael Trujillo, or El Jefe. Trujillo controlled every aspect of Dominican life, from the press, to the post office, to the police. He had spies and informants everywhere. Nobody was safe. As scholar Nancy Robinson wrote, every Dominican family had a victim of Trujillo in its closet. Enter the Mirabal sisters. Born in Ojo de Agua, the sisters Patria, Minerva, Maria Teresa, and Dede came from an educated, well-to-do family. Their beauty, Minerva's especially, proved to be their curse in Trujillo's Dominican Republic. Trujillo was obsessed with possessing women. His machismo was legendary. He would send out beauty scouts to find young women to invite to the National Palace every week. Families dared not refuse such an invitation, even knowing full well it meant the girl, and very often they were schoolgirls, would have to sleep with the dictator or be his mistress. A very R. Kelly sort of situation. Families would actually hide their daughters if Trujillo was in the neighborhood, for fear he would take a liking to one of them. Well, Trujillo took a liking to the Mirabal sisters, specifically Minerva. They were invited to a party at one of Trujillo's estates, and when he wouldn't take no for an answer, Minerva slapped the dictator in the face. To repeat, Minerva Mirabal slapped a murderous, lecherous dictator. Amazingly, this made Trujillo take stock of his actions, reconsider his life choices, and write a detailed apology to Minerva. No, I'm kidding. He proceeded to make life hell for Minerva and the Mirabal family. He imprisoned Minerva's father, who died shortly after his release, and Minerva and her mother were held hostage. The only way Trujillo would release them was if Minerva had sex with him. She refused, and the two women managed to escape. Minerva goes to law school. Starting her second year, she finds she was barred from classes unless she gave a speech praising Trujillo. When she graduated with top honors, she was unable to practice law because the government would not grant her a license. Trujillo had the Mirabal family in a stranglehold. The sisters and their husbands were blacklisted. They could not work. Their finances dwindled. What had started as a resistance to Trujillo's amorous advances had become an all-out war between the sisters and Trujillo. This encouraged Patria, Minerva, and Maria Teresa to become politically active in the underground anti-Trujillo movement. Minerva especially became a major figure in the move to overthrow the government. The sisters went by the code name Las Mariposas, the Butterflies. Inspired by the Cuban Revolution in 1959, the Mirabal sisters, their husbands, and other anti-Trujillistas planned to blow up Trujillo at the cattle fair in 1960. But Trujillo's informants discovered the plot, and all except younger sister Dede were arrested. By this time, even the Catholic Church condemned his actions, forcing Trujillo to release many of the women he had imprisoned, including the Mirabal sisters, but not their husbands. As political opinion against Trujillo became more outspoken and foreign allies withdrew their support, Trujillo focused his ire on the Mirabal sisters. In November of 1960, Trujillo said he only had two problems, the Catholic Church and the Mirabal sisters. Obviously, in dictator land, it was time for Trujillo to order Patria, Minerva, and Maria Teresa to be killed. 
It was an elaborate, if somewhat bumbling, setup. The sisters' husbands, still imprisoned, were moved to a prison in far-off Puerto Plata. Going to see their husbands required the sisters to travel by car over a mountain range. They knew full well this was a trap set up by Trujillo, but nevertheless, they continued to make the trek. On November 25, 1960, while crossing the mountain range, the Mirabal sisters' jeep was ambushed by Trujillo's agents. Patria was able to briefly escape and reach a passing truck. She told him who she was, what Trujillo's agents were about to do to her, and told him to spread the word. He sped off, and the sisters and their driver, Rufino de la Cruz, were bludgeoned and strangled. Their bodies were then put back into the jeep and pushed over a cliff. It should be noted that Rufino de la Cruz knew full well what he was getting into when he drove the Mirabal sisters, but he chose to do it anyway. In the aftermath of the Mirabal sisters' assassination, it was obvious that the sisters had been murdered. There were fingerprints all over their bodies and all over the jeep. Despite Trujillo's attempt to extinguish his Mirabal sisters' problem, it was their murder and these bodies that proved to be his downfall. Trujillo was certainly guilty of countless other crimes, but the murder, the sisters' bodies, how obvious it all was, was for some reason the unforgivable last straw. The tide turned, popular support waned, and six months later, the military assassinated Trujillo. The death of the Mirabal sisters was tragic, but it also toppled a dictator. In the years since the Trujillo regime, the Mirabal sisters have become iconic in the Dominican Republic and symbols of women's political power around the world. International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women is celebrated every November 25th in their honor. On November 25th, 2000, the remains of Patria, Minerva, Maria Teresa, and Manolo, Minerva's husband, were buried at the last house they lived in, which is now a museum in their honor, Casa Museo Hermanas Mirabal. Along with artifacts of their lives are artifacts from their murder, including a bloody handkerchief and Maria Teresa's long braid, cut at the morgue by her youngest sister, Dede, who ran the museum until her death in 2014. The candle has gone out, which I suppose it's trying to tell me to wrap up the video. I get the hint, thanks. These women did not just pass into oblivion, but fought to control their bodies and their rights until their last breath. In some ways, am I not always harping on you to do the same thing? I'm not saying you should get your sister to decapitate your corpse, but you know what I mean. So Takeko Nagano and the Mirabal sisters, we honor you all as iconic corpses, inspirational warrior women, and proof that a tragic death need not make a tragic corpse. Special thanks to Jason Porath, whose artwork you saw in this video. He has an amazing site, Rejected Princesses, which is a treasure trove of badass historical women. This video was made with generous donations from death enthusiasts just like you. Here I am. Works so hard to be in focus. Oh, my beings. <laughs> Come on, beings. Whether stolen like Ava Perone, exploit. What? <laughs> Okay, I put a ton of hairspray on the bang, so hopefully they're like, oh no, I'm sure you're not fucking gonna go anywhere. Good. And symbols of women's political power. Blah. <laughs> dun dun dun. Here we go.